Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is David Sproles, and I'm the president of the New York School of Interior Design. Uh, we are thrilled to have you here this evening for the annual Sally Henderson Memorial Lecture on Green Design, which, we, which will be presented this evening by Rick Fedrizi and Randy Pfizer. Sally Henderson was a beloved faculty member here at NYSID and developed the college's first course in green design. Upon her untimely death in 2002, an endowed fund was set up in her memory to support an annual lecture on sustainable design. Thanks in part to Sally's pioneering efforts, NYSID is dedicated to educating future designers who incorporate sustainable solutions in their practices. Sustainability runs throughout our curriculum uh, in nearly every program. In addition, we have a one-year Master of Professional Studies in Sustainable Interior Environments. Tonight, we are pleased to have Rick and Randy, uh, who will discuss their visions for harnessing the power of design to transform the human experience. Rick is the chairman and CEO of the International Well Building Institute, a public benefit corporation that advances buildings and puts human health and wellness at the center of their design and operation. Rick is also founding chair of the U.S. Green Building Council and former CEO of both USGBC and of Green Business Certification, Inc., nonprofit organizations that promote high-performing buildings and communities. He serves on numerous boards and advisory councils, including the Center for Health and the Global Environment at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, Energy Focus, and Global Green. Uh, his book, Green Think, How Profit Can Save the Planet, won a prestigious EPI, E-P-P-Y? EPI. EPI. <laughs> EPI Award for Public Affairs in 2015. Rick is joined tonight by Randy Pfizer, CEO of the American Society of Interior Designers, ASID. Uh, Randy leads the society's 25,000 plus members from commercial and residential sectors across North America to advance the profession and communicate the transformative power of design in people's lives. Since being named CEO in 2012, Randy has invested heavily in research, enhanced ASID's reach through new partnerships, and moved the ASID headquarters into an award-winning living laboratory studying the impact of design in the workplace. His mission and message strive, they strive to demonstrate that hiring an interior designer is not only a good return on investment, but a decision that transforms lives. Both Rick and Randy also serve on the advisory board of Delos, a pioneer of wellness real estate. Uh, and Delos, I should mention, recently received NYSID's annual Green Design Award at our gala dinner uh, last Monday, March 6th. So, I've said a lot. Uh, without <laughs> further ado, the, the platform is all of yours. <laughs> great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah. So it's great to be here. Great to be here with you, Rick, Thank as you. well. Um, and David, congratulations on New York School of Interior Design's uh, prestigious uh, recognition as the number one school for interior design um, this year. That's fantastic on your centennial. And congratulations to Ellen Fisher as well, who works with us a lot um, at ASID. Um, this, I think, uh, the, one of the best ways, I think, to start this conversation is really about why now? Um, what is this inflection point that we're seeing around health and wellness and well-being um, in design uh, and, you know, particularly with interiors as a focus point of this? Um, and where is this going and how does this connect into the well certification in IWBI? Um, and, um, and what does this mean for practice? Um, and what does this mean for the future of design as we go through it? Um, so in starting that conversation, um, what I'm really thinking about from an ASID perspective and from an interior design perspective um, is that there is a, a legacy of interior designers who have been focused in on this work for, for a long time um, and really understood that the impact a space has on human health and well-being um, was critically connected. Um, we all know the statistics now, we're spending 93% of our time indoors um, and unfortunately 70% of that time is also spent seated um, and that is actually changing us as human beings. Um, we are becoming more obese, um, we have more um, instances of asthma, we have um, issues of stress that are coming from the environments that are not conducive to what our bodies really yearn for and need. Um, which is light, air, good water, good um, environments to move and be active in. 
I and mean, instead we're creating this sedentary world that is um, really impacting us as humans. Um, and I think what we've found is that interior designers understand that. They inherently understand how to create in environments for people, um, but they haven't had the platform to be able to really elevate their practice and push their, their work into environments and spaces and also have a curriculum that supports how they get trained to do this at a higher and higher level. Again, there are leaders out there. Um, we have many of them in the audience who have been doing this their entire lifetime. Um, but there is a, um, a set of folks out there that are doing the work and calling themselves interior designers that are not really connecting to what this is. And we think that now is the time to really refocus us on what interior spaces are doing, how they're impacting us, and how we really do use interior designers and the skills that you are trained in um, and interior designers are trained in to create the environments that we need to thrive in our lives. Um, and, and I think that is what our focus is. Um, and as an organization, we look for opportunities to build networks and partnerships um, through our work and our messages that we're trying to create. And in October of 2014, when, um, when the International Well Building Institute and um, the Well Standard was launched, um, we were right there um, to uh, see how we could work together um, with the organization um, that was creating the standard to bring it into the interior design community and to work with that to drive it forward. Um, and Rick and I have crossed paths in his recent tenure, which <laughs> I know he'll talk about um, as the CEO um, for IWBI in IDEX in Toronto. And really, um, for our first time as the leaders of the two organizations got an opportunity to start partnering again together as you took on this new role. Um, so I think that's a great segue for you to start talking about your your journey into from sustainability into health and wellness. And actually, it's not too far of a journey because it, it you were really talking about it all along. It really <laughs> is it, Randy. Thank you. And thanks, all of you, for being here tonight. Um, it, it really is. Uh, I was thinking about it in the, in the, uh, in the cab on the way over that there is um, uh, a very logical progression between the world that we're talking about right now with well and 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 using a rating system that is related to real estate to transform a market because we did that with lead and when we were doing this with lead after all of the years of having um, arguably some really horrific buildings being built and and um, I think it actually coincided directly with the disco era. But from, <laughs> from the early 70s to about 85, the buildings, um, I, I, it's, you know, I'm not an architect, uh, but I can tell you that, that a lot of architects would agree that there was a, a, a kind of a mindless period of building very quickly, uh, using cheap materials, uh, uh, trying to, to uh, maximize the ROI and flip the building. And so there, where, where, the, where the passion was lost for that kind of, of uh, construction and architecture, I think it's not um, surprising that people end up losing interest. Cities and communities, I think, suffered. And uh, people got unhealthy. The, the sick building syndrome uh, happened during those years. Um, and it was something that uh, I think LEED did really well with the work of the U.S. Green Building Council, and, and we always called that a renaissance. We were taking that moment in history, and, and through a, a rating tool, we were going to create a renaissance where design mattered again. And, and, and full disclosure, when I was at USGBC and we were talking about LEED, the design often meant the design of the, of the building from the standpoint of the, the corn shell, the, the, the structures around it where you know, daylight, uh, energy, water, waste, and materials uh, were, were a part of it. And in the LEED rating system, there was a, a percentage of about 20, I think we've uh, uh, calculated about 25, 27% of the credits that actually uh, led us down the path to understand why an interior space would be healthier if in fact the right decisions were made. Well, when you look at WELL today, and, and Paul and uh, the Dallas organization, when they decided that this was going to be an important moment to expand upon that 25% uh, uh, credit crossover and really start to look at the, uh, the modern definition of health and wellness, especially as it relates to the built environment. And the modern definition <clears throat> really is about meeting people where they live, work, play, sleep, learn, heal, worship, 
the, 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 the opportunities are everywhere around us. We do spend 90 or 93 percent of our lives indoors. We go from one box to another box. <clears throat> I think it's been the work of designers for a very long time to make those boxes much more pleasant for the people that, that occupy them. And, and I would argue that the, a lot, if you look at the, the um, attributes of the well rating system, so much of that are probably directly related to pathways and questions that you have all had in your profession for the last 50 years. I think as we started going inside, as the windows got smaller, as the envelope got tighter, as all of these things happened and materials were kind of turned into something that was uh, cheap and mass produced. Your, your ability to work with your clients and find the best paths, pathways that made them feel better. And, and maybe it wasn't always uh, described in, in terms of, of health and wellness, but it was described in terms of, of uh, mood and, and uh, inspiration and, and the ability for the light to open a space or the materials to deaden sound or some, some element that you always inherently worked with to give your clients the product that they wanted. What Well is, is doing right now is understanding that, um, that there are a lot of, of people, organizations, uh, real estate opportunities that don't always have that ability to, uh, to uh, transform their own individual space. So we go into an office building, <clears throat> our employers make those decisions for us. Sometimes they're good decisions, sometimes they're bad decisions. But what we have now is the ability that through a rating tool, we can help a design team early on in the, in the project understand where the, the opportunity exists with light and air and acoustics and the areas of comfort and mind and fitness and nutrition, where these things can actually be embedded into the fabric. And, and I'm bringing this right back around to the beginning again because I don't think this is, people have asked me, is this something new? Is it something different than LEED? And, and I actually think it's phase two of the Renaissance. The, the Renaissance, you can't transform everything all at one time. The, 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 you know, the real estate world for a very long time in the earliest years when you said we had a rating tool for sustainability that was going to change the way you think about buildings forever, um, I can't tell you how many doors got slammed in my face, how many times people were like, oh, this meeting's over, you know? Yeah. And, and that changed. There's not, I don't think there's a new construction uh, location in the United States today, new construction uh, totally, that, um, that uh, can be built without 60 to 80 percent of that, even if it's not done as a lead building, even if it's not done in the vein of a true green sustainable building, you can't not buy those high performing materials, products, systems, and, and so forth anymore. They don't exist because we, we shifted the market's interest so much that the ability to sell um, uh, horrible products that, that, that off gas terribly, that, that knowledge is out there. And there are still some that slip through, but we are more and more vigilant of the materials and the systems and where they come from. And, and I think that this wellness movement and the well rating system um, is a logical next step. And, and, and it puts the focus on, for years, and, and most of my um, US GBC speeches, I would talk about steel, bricks, glass, mortar. I would talk about the building. And I would say, you know what? At the end of the day, though, it's really about the people inside. A green building for the sake of, of art or sculpture doesn't really matter. What matters is the human being inside of it, the child in the school, the, the person healing in a hospital, whatever structure that is, that is what matters. And ultimately, I think through LEED, through WELL, um, through other rating systems around the world that, that have focused on sustainability, um, we collectively have transformed the market. This next opportunity for wellness and health related to the built environment, um, 
you all are squarely in the middle of this opportunity. I think more so than any other time before, because it is it is so logical that your profession is at the front door of every opportunity in in this uh, arena. And when you look at the well standard and you visit a well building, and I know you will see you will see one yourself, and and there will be a lot of them uh, that you can tour and visit and experience. Um, you will sense something different. You'll sense it in, in the freshness of the air, the, the, uh, the uh, not too dry, not too humid, um, the acoustics, the light. All of these things will just give you this subtle reference point, but then you're going to sense something different. And that is the culture of the people that are working in that space. Because the well rating system actually encourages a, an owner or developer to bring your, your employees along for the journey. And they start understanding that this is not going to be just another really pretty building or space. This is actually going to be a space that is encouraging me to take the stairs and, and sourcing food locally and, and organically so that I can, number one, learn about that. But number two, um, I won't make a bad choice because usually I have to run six blocks to go get something and I don't usually do that. So I'll just have another quad shot latte and just call it a day. But all of these things, and, and culturally people um, having workstations that, that are just tr completely transferable, where you might work in one part of the building one day and another part the next day, where there's a, a communication opportunity that didn't exist prior to that. I think, I think the cultural effect of a well building will actually be something that, um, uh, that uh, very smart people, psychiatrists, psychologists, will study someday. And they'll realize probably that it's not, it's not uh, we were so smart, we created something so new. It really brings us back to the earliest days of when people would congregate, where where the town hall or the town square mattered, where people didn't own a space, they shared it with others, and ultimately, um, we we should learn a lot by this next experiment. So we're we're very excited about it. Yeah, and I and I think you know connecting into some of the things you've said and bringing it and connecting it into practice um, and how practice may change. Um, I think we've seen evolutions um, in interior design and inflection points in interior design um, in a community that sometimes is disaggregated. Um, and what this hopefully will do is bring that community back together. Um, by disaggregation, what I mean is we have a, a significant push in the interior design world, um, whether that's practitioners or it's how we talk about interior design. Um, and one of that the dimensions of that and one of the continuum components on it is the the lifestyle of space and really not focusing in on whether space matters to a person and the impact that that environment has on them that will be on the other side but instead using it as a status tool and talking about space from a standpoint of i had such and such designer design my space or such and such product was in my space and all oh, that relates to who i am as an individual and some level of status um, in society and and there is the fundamental element of craft that is a part of interior design, which is about textures and fabrics and colors and other types of things that an interior designer needs to know that creates a beautiful space. But when you move over to the other end of the continuum, which really is the fundamental impact that space has on people, there is another group of designers that are really focused in on that and have been advocating for that for decades about how space impacts people, why you design a space um, for an individual and a life and a, a set of circumstances that a person is dealing with and not do it and, and do it exceptionally so that it, it impacts and, and it elevates that person's life. Um, and so what I see is a bringing together of this community and not talking about it as two polar opposites, but literally talking about it as how do spaces both aesthetically bring beauty into space because that is a component of actually well but also have this functionality component that really supports life and work and health and environment and other things together um, and and I, I hope by creating a standard that also within that creates a level of practice associated with it 
that you'll see an alignment of the community around this. And that's what we've been trying to do is to, to, to move from this two ends of a spectrum and actually bring the, 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 the component together. Um, too many conversations happen among people who re reference themselves as interior designers about this lifestyle component that doesn't impact, doesn't talk about the impact of people. And there are, are, are um, real needs in, in our world to represent our profession and our practice in the appropriate way and have others who are making products that are servicing the profession and also people who are talking about us through media and other outlets that they also represent us in the way that we are um, practicing and what we need to be doing in practice. Um, and I think what really grounds well and really helps this um, conversation is the evidence that's behind it um, and the research that's behind it. There's been a lot of that done in various aspects of the profession, but by having a standard that is grounded so deeply in research to get you there sure. um, in the seven years that, that sort of the investment that has been aggregating and doing your own independent research, I think that really fundamentally changes the conversation as well, is there is an ability to connect return on investment, right. um, as well as to be able to t connect to why these decisions matter um, when you actually take systems and bodily systems um, and are able to map them to each decision that you make. Um, so if you make a decision to say, you know, this lighting solution is what I'm putting into your space, and by the way, this is how it hits your neurological system, it hits, how it hits your, your um, respiratory system, and how it impacts your, um, your cardiovascular system, that's a whole different layer of conversation um, that has to happen, um, and, and you guys are supporting that and driving that. No, absolutely. I mean, it, it, was, it was one thing to, uh, and in fact, we made, I think, a, a very similar but a good decision in building the lead rating system. We had to rely on the, the pre-published thresholds that other organizations that were in, in those areas specifically, whether it was lighting or air quality or, or thermal comfort. So, so the lead standard actually supported those things. In, in this medical opportunity, where, where medicine is the baseline for the development of the standard and the credits, we have to rely as well on that kind of, of opportunity. But there are some things that are so brand new right now. Um, scientists probably, I, I think it's something were 20, 25 years ago, really understood that this circadian lighting cycle for human beings is an important thing. We always associate that with jet lag. And, and ultimately, uh, there is the ability for us to, to not get enough of the right quality of light so that our bodies don't produce enough melatonin so that we don't get a good night's sleep. And that perpetuates a cycle of waking up tired, having a bad day the next day, if you think of the loss of productivity and, and, and value to whatever your job function is, um, you, you have the ability through, uh, through technologies now to adjust the lighting that balances outdoor light and indoor light and the light that is coming from your computer screens and ultimately giving your body during the you know, 8 to 10 or 12 hours that a lot of people are in an office setting a different end result. You go home more refreshed, you sleep better, you wake up uh, more energized, your work and, and activities the next day. And I don't, this isn't meant to sound just like uh, this is all about the work that we do every day. A good night's sleep is also going to give you a, a, a better uh, uh, um, emotional connection to your family. It's going to give you the ability to make maybe some better choices um, uh, relative to uh, uh, a number of things, but, but especially the way that you, you treat your, your own self, having the ability to um, uh, I make a lot of jokes about how many uh, uh, quad shot lattes I have at Starbucks. And oftentimes that seems to me to be the, 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 the way that you can get through, you know, three or four flights a week and, and not sleeping well in hotels and going on to the next event the next day and so forth. But if we start to really understand <clears throat> our spaces, the opportunity they afford us and, and, and rely on the science now that is giving information on that. There's information that we've never had before because now we have a reason to study it on acoustics and, and, and the ability for us to truly understand how, how quiet do we need something to be. 
and how too quiet is almost as bad as a noisy environment. Um, lighting the, 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 that I mentioned, um, but this, this combination of different sources of lighting, whether it's outdoor light, uh, the overhead lighting, the computer uh, screen in front of you lighting, um, your brain is doing apparently a magnificent job balancing all of those three stimulus. And in that, your, try, your brain is actually trying to level that out to give you uh, the, the best opportunity for probably the production of melatonin. Um, in, in most cases, we disrupt that because of our lifestyles. Um, we stay up too late, we watch television too late, we check our email in the middle of the night, you know, that little thing that makes everybody just say, you know, who is really banging me at three in the morning, but, it, you know, you, you, you see that blue light and it disrupts your brain, and again, you have to have uh, some kind of compensation there. Um, I think it's fascinating how many areas that the, the built environment that you all design around, how many areas really truly affect our physiology, our, our psychology, and, and we, I think we all knew that anecdotally, mm -hmm. but I think now the science is going to back all of that up and we'll have some, some much better information to support it. Yeah. And I, it's, it's been interesting that, um, so I, my background coming from um, organization development consulting, I worked at Buzell and Hamilton and used to do org change and leadership development and, and, and actually in a part of my career I also looked at uh, work-life balance issues and, and health and wellness of people and family as it relates to programs and initiatives you put into corporations. Um, and in that history of doing that, um, a few uh, two decades ago to uh, present, uh, when I stepped into the role of uh, CEO of ACD, we never talked about space as a part of that formula. It was wellness programs, smoking cessation, weight loss programs, um, and it was all of these other things that we, we were talking about as we were putting in interventions for employees, but we knew that health and wellness was important to productivity, engagement, and retention of our staff. Um, and we knew that these programs were something that we should be doing, um, especially when our employees were not showing up to work and they weren't healthy. Um, so what I think has been wonderful about this, and I'd love to, to get your perception is um, four months into the job, you know, long time um, tenure, but I know you've already been traveling around the world related to this. Um, I've been finding that now that you enter the conversation of space into the corporate environment, um, and, and you bring that to the table and connect it into what they were already doing with health, wellness, and well-being for their employees, a light bulb goes off immediately. So it's, it's not a, I have to convince you that this matters. It's just like, oh my God, why haven't we been doing spaces sure. that relates to this? And it very, it's a much easier conversation than I think sustainability even was at, at one point with, yeah. um, with companies because you were talking about something more extrinsic of the environment and climate change and, and things along those lines. But this has been, for me, um, in my conversations with corporate America, a much easier, yes, this matters and we should have been doing this all along. And the nice thing it does is it really does, as you said earlier, knit together the, the design team with the HR team, with the facilities team, um, and really gets them talking on projects as from inception all the way through to completion. Right. Um, have you been kind of experiencing that as well? Sure, um, sure. The, you know, that word? No, the, um, <laughs> the, the uh, uh, attraction and retention of employees for most organizations is one of the single largest, uh, most important elements of running their business. Um, I, you know, we all know that 90 plus percent of the, of the expense of an organization, you know, the, the entire cost goes towards the employee. The energy, the water, and the waste, those are, those are incidental uh, in, in comparison to what the human being is about. So most HR organizations have been trained that we have to do more for our employees. We have to uh, have, they, they really have not, I think until now, started to make the connection to the, to the space, as you yeah. just said. 
but but they what they've done is you know they've racked their brains trying to think of what do we do do we do we do team building exercises do we uh, create gym memberships or fitness and, and and nutrition counseling and they're trying to find this 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 uh, holy grail of something that would that would engage their employees and make them feel good about it um, on average, uh, the uh, annual budget per employee for a lot of large organizations is about $700. And that $700 is to be spent on these opportunities for uh, health and wellness. Uh, not direct insurance costs. These are things above and beyond that that would be applied to, um, uh, to their employees. And, um, and we're starting to, to, to have a discussion internally, and I think it makes a lot of sense. And this is something that will be important in the context of the work that you do here. The, um, the capital budget, building budget, is oftentimes where we have always thought about a green, sustainable improvement, or in the earliest days, health and wellness, if we're going to redesign a space, then you know how much is in the budget for, for renovation, and what kind of materials can we select, and so forth. But if we do the math, and on average, and again, we, we, are, we are in the early stages of this, so we, we don't have the, the uh, many thousands of building population that USGBC and LEED had, but in the early stages, it looks like with a $100 per person investment, these changes, hard and soft costs for the renovation could be done. So ultimately, based on the size of the building, based on the opportunity in front of you, then $100 of that $700 that's not in, in many cases, or most cases, they're saying only 20% of, um, of that money is being actually utilized by the employee. You know, because a lot of employees are like, great, I, you, I'm glad you offer a gym membership, but I don't want a gym membership. Or, you know, uh, you think I need nutrition counseling? And, and so there's, there's a lot of that money that's not spent. But if $100 of that could shift to the, to the base budget of the building and the renovation opportunity uh, or the construction opportunity, um, it would be a, a much easier sell because that is a one-time spend to get all of that renovation done with all of those great attributes that do nothing but support and encourage uh, health and wellness for the uh, employee population going forward. So, so it's, it's, there's so much of this uh, that is brand new, and, and it really is a, it's a, uh, an exciting learning curve because uh, w when you think you understand the rules, you realize in this, it's completely different. Yeah. I had, um, um, well, it was, it was the CEO of, uh, of General Electric, Jeff Emelt. Um, uh, my son and his daughter were graduating from the same college at the same time, and we were introduced, and I said something about the uh, Green Building Council and LEED, and he says, oh, yeah, he goes, uh, I don't really care about lead, and 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 as I was uh, uh, slightly uh, um, upset and a little bit pissed, I was like, um, kidding? I, uh, he followed it up quickly with, "But my employees do, and the pe the the people that we want to attract to this company do." Yeah. And if you think of the future of our workforce, and I see a lot of our, our future workforce sitting in front of me right now. This, yes, I'm looking at you too. Uh, <laughs> when, when you look at that, you, the kind of spaces that young people want to work in are not the one. We were, my generation was grateful to be in a room that had cinder block walls and you know a door and no window because we just thought that was, that was what mattered. It was a job and, and it didn't matter where it was, I had a job. But, but we, and, and thank God that there is a different focus on what matters and why design matters and and, and what values uh, the, the next um, uh, wave of, of our workforce will have relative to the kind of places that they work in or, or, or even, even I, I have a lot of uh, uh, university um, uh, chancellors and presidents telling me this starts at the college level right now. Students are actually starting to, to demand what kind of space, what is the, the way we're going to live in, in the dorms? What kind of food do you serve in the cafeteria? They, they're asking questions that, that I'm ashamed we never had the guts yeah. to ask. And, <laughs> and uh, I think it's great, but I think this is that second wave yeah. of the renaissance and it'll transform everything yeah i absolutely agree and and you know i agree with it so much that when asid had the 
um, opportunity to move our headquarters, which was um, this last year. Uh, we moved into a, a new space in May of uh, 2016. Um, so we're coming up on our first year in the space. Um, we actually designed it um, looking at health, wellness, and well-being as the outcome that we wanted with the goal of achieving um, uh, productivity gains, retention gains, and all the other components that go with it, and, and actually studying it, doing a pre-occupancy and a post-occupancy evaluation. Um, so lots and lots and lots of research coming out about the new headquarters will be coming out over the next year of how this space that we've created matters and why it matters and what it has accomplished. Um, we also, in that process of designing the headquarters um, and, and creating um, what David referred to as the living laboratory, um, uh, we wanted to not just validate it ourselves and say, hey, didn't we do a great job of creating a sustainable environment and a healthy environment and, a, and doing all these things, but instead look to having a third party come in and assess it and, and, and let us know whether or not it was doing what it, we had intended it for it to do. Um, so I'm happy to say we've actually already re achieved LEED Platinum um, certification with the space. Um, and we are on a very good path. We've had the assessor in already to be a well platinum space, which would actually make the ASED headquarters representing the interior design profession as the first LEED well platinum space in the world. So I get you. No, that, thank you. <laughs> um, and the great thing about it is, again, we, we put our money where our mouth is when we did this, and, and we spent the money to do the pre- and post-occupancy evaluation. So there are nine different studies going on in the office um, at, all at once. Um, and that goes to looking at the light levels. Um, it, we are measuring CO2 me, um, emissions constantly. We're measuring through ozone sensors the air quality. Um, we have water filtration systems. We're measuring energy utilization. Um, we have, um, we now have uh, built into the space uh, uh, sensors, um, and through our office reservation system, which uh, allows people to. We have an agile office, so nobody has a an assigned space. Even as the CEO of the organization, I sit where I need to sit based upon the work I'm doing that day. Um, we have three people who basically answer the telephone. Um, they, they take 4,000 phone calls a month. Um, thank you very much for calling us. We really appreciate it. <laughs> they have a dedicated space. Um, but other than that, everybody is mobile. Um, they move where they need to work and how they need to work, um, which means there's private offices to go to, meeting spaces, all that kind of stuff. Um, but through that, we have a reservation system that allows us to understand the utilization of the space. But knowing that human beings are value, um, we have our, our we have our limitations on a, you know, selecting a room and actually saying we're going to go to the room and using the room. Um, we sometimes just walk in and use them and other things. We put sensors in the space and we actually connect their cell phones and the Bluetooth to the sensors. So we have heat maps that will be able to see utilization of the space um, and how people do it. Um, we wore um, sociometric badges which have um, GPS in them so they understand movement. Um, they also had Bluetooth in them which understands the so the badges talk to each other and they knew who you were standing by so if Rick and I were standing next to each other it knew that we were in proximity um, and it had um, infrared sensors so if we were actually facing each other and in dialogue it would pick up the fact that we were talking and it had voice recognition to the point that it knew the conversation was going on um, so we went deep into the whole study of the space um, and everybody volunteered um, so it was a voluntary component we didn't ask or we didn't force people in and there is no ability to track oh well Randy was in the bathroom too much today and Rick was <laughs> in you know whatever it happens to be um, what we have is an ability to say that a individual who had this number um, happens to be there and the research teams that we've hired so we work with Michigan State University and Cornell University and some of their PhD students um, on some of these studies um, and they have been doing this so I think some real exciting um, you know, study is going to be coming out of this yeah. um, and I know we're just one of others that are doing this um, which I think pivots nicely mm -hmm. into Delos and the Well Living Lab sure. and, and I know that's um, uh, Delos is well but I know you know some things about that and I might want to share um, so we are an open system environment so we you know different people can come in and go and and, and interact with us um, and we're not monitoring ourselves uh, um, like a hot 
a, a research facility or research institution right. could. Um, but you guys do have that controlled environment through the Davos Living Lab. Yeah, we do. Um, it, it's, it's really interesting. I think that, that one of the main reasons why I was hired into my job is the fact that the founders of uh, Well and IWBI were also uh, the uh, owners of an uh, organization called Delos that was basically a company dedicated to the intersection of health and well-being and real estate. So technologies, products, materials, other systems were what they wanted to invest in because they really believe. Um, and thank God, because I think it's 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 really in, uh, where where this is all coming from. That there is a, a massive opportunity uh, in this. I think McKinsey says it's a uh, uh, almost a two trillion dollar industry already, and and doubling every other year. So. Um, when you start looking at the fact that that's where we are shifting and, and moving towards, one of the things they did is they studied lead. They said, this is, we need this for health and wellness. And um, they brought me on board because um, it's really important um, to create a, a very, because of the nature of the Delos work, it's very important to create the firewall whereby none of the products, programs, services will, will gravitate towards the well rating system in any way, shape, or manner. And they're very, very carefully yeah. helping us create this opportunity to separate the two businesses effectively. Everything in the well rating system is, is based on a threshold. So the idea that the threshold can be met by 10 products in lighting, for example, one of which is Delos, that's fine. But you don't ever want a scenario where the rating system actually has a threshold that only one organization can meet. And that, oh, by the way, that happens to be your parent organization. Um, I, I, I learned a lot during the years of LEAD and, and, and how we were able to separate the work of the organization by creating GBCI. And I think this is a very similar thing. Yeah. So it's, 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 uh, it's wonderful because what we have is um, we have the ability uh, to utilize the Well Living Lab that Randy um, uh, mentioned. Uh, this one is at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, there is one right now that is being developed in Beijing and one in the UK. Um, and what it is, it's a real li life uh, living lab opportunity where um, um, you, you can imagine uh, a, a, an upper box and a lower box. The upper box looks just like any office or any school or any hotel, whatever way you design it. Below it is another box, and in that are sensors and air systems and dampers and 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 thermal comfort and and all these these different technologies and obviously uh, the the data capture infra, uh, tools that will 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 capture that. But they will actually have uh, groups of people um, uh, working in a space there, let's just say, doing uh, cognitive-related functions, whether it's a test or, or uh, some kind of, of uh, uh, programming or whatever it may be. And through um, playing with uh, air quality, um, too much CO2, too little CO2, uh, the VOCs, um, uh, raising or lowering the temperature, watching the effect of, of, of what a human being uh, does in those conditions. And the, uh, the obvious is that you want to optimize all of those conditions to create the exact right threshold so that we can make sure that we, we are performing at our absolute highest level in, in any place that we are. I think the future is taking um, research and data like that and, and utilizing it to create a scenario very similar to what you were talking about, Randy, with the um, with the uh, uh, ability to track uh, employees um, in a variety of settings. But the, the wearables of the future, the things that probably look like a Fitbit, um, are, are actually going to probably uh, talk to the dampers above you in your office. And if, and if you didn't you know, get a good night's sleep and you are feeling kind of fatigued, that damper might bring in a little more uh, fresh outside air. It might drop the temperature in the room a degree. It might ramp the lighting up just a, a spectrum that maybe you can't, your brain can't even perceive. But all done in the context of, of enriching you. Um, I, have a, I have a friend who, and I'll tell you what she does uh, in, in a second, but um, when I told her all this great stuff that I was doing, how excited I was, she said, oh, she goes, we've been doing that for 60, 70 years. And I said, 60 or 70 years? Well, she is the director of a zoo. 
and, and as the, the <laughs> leading expert in primates, she said for the last 60 or 70 years, we, we have studied like the, the air quality and the lighting that they need and the kind of materials, and we're trying to recreate something that, that, that allows them not only uh, to uh, have an enriched, healthy experience, but, but even so, so much so that they, they want to uh, uh, breed and, 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 and have you know, future generations, they, they feel so, so much a part of it. And, and, and she laughed because, and I sort of laughed, but <laughs> when, you, when you realize it, we have, we have thought about every, every possibility, even a child knows enough when their parent gives them a, a little, well, in my case it was a turtle, you know, you just wanted to create the perfect uh, environment for them, but somehow human beings were left out of that for a very long yeah. time. And I think this is a way, you know, to get back to that and to get back to it in a way that is is meaningful. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I answered your no, question. No, absolutely. That, the, um, and, and I think the and I'd love to so start thinking about your questions because we're going to be opening up for questions here. Um, I, I keep talking about this from the standpoint of we're shifting a conversation with this holistic system that we're talking about from the way that everybody talked about um, space um, at a cost per square foot. Um, and it was always how do we, how do we um, get the most or the least amount of cost per square foot. Um, into a value per square foot conversation. So able to connect it into the return on investment component, which means it's an investment in something bigger that comes out the back end of it. And, and going to your conversation about um, if we are focusing on workplace or healthcare facilities or others, um, there is a cost in that system and a cost of unproductiveness within that environment, whether that is through people or utilization of space or something along those lines, is a cost to, the, to that mm -hmm. business. Um, and if you can begin to flip it the other way, which is how do you maximize the utilization of space, how do you maximize human beings you, within that space, you actually start getting into a large return on investment that adds up very, very quickly, going to the fact that this is 90% of your expenditures um, that you're spending your money on. Um, so I think coming full circle on this, um, when we can position the interior designer in the corner, in the in the, the conversation, as the driver of value to the organization, and that you are not a cost center, but you are a value proposition to that organization, and the things that you do with the HR and the other people on these teams to create an environment that improves um, the utilization of space and people, um, you now are a complete value add to the overall system. And guess what? You can charge more for that. <laughs> When you charge more for that. Yeah, when, <laughs> yeah, when, you, when you are able to generate a saying, I can add $3.9 million to your bottom line, your fees no longer are a point of discussion mm -hmm. um, as much as they were uh, and currently are. So that, you know, coming back to self-centeredness in all of this, um, which a lot of us are, um, you can help your own living situation by improving the lives of others. Very nice to come back to that. Um, so with that, I, I don't know if you have a final thought, but um, or maybe we'll wave our final thoughts to the end, very end. But let's go to Q and A, and then sure. we'll come back to a final sure. final comments um, from from you on this. So any questions from folks um, regarding all of this? Yeah. So I'm sitting here from a manufacturer's perspective. Sure. To, um, take uh, glass that's thrown away at the curb and turn it into glass tile. Being green is in our DNA for 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, and that before it was painful and important. Or, um, do you see uh, any type of recognition from well that these products are certified or recognized or approved or that uh, you need that are sustainable or green mm -hmm. products? Yeah. Um, what what very uh, where I believe it will go, and in, in the way it is right now, is that well, I I I actually believe a rating system should not pick a product and certify a particular product. 
that our threshold may in fact say that we are looking for this percentage of non-toxic material, maybe this percentage of recycled opportunity. But, but in that percentage, you know, many products might have the ability to meet that threshold. Um, I think that the, uh, there are organizations out there that are looking very carefully at all this. I know there's at least three major organizations that desperately want to get into rating products and materials based on uh, human health and wellness, just like they did for sustainability. Um, I, I personally um, think that, that the, the work in front of us and, and helping to create a standard um, that, that helps an organization uh, evolve their entire design uh, uh, paradigm. To me, um, it's better for us not to enter that uh, direct uh, certification of a, of a product or a material. But, but those products and materials that meet the threshold, and we will certainly rely on best-in-class products to, to eventually get our committees to, to reach those thresholds properly, will benefit, I think, in many ways. So thank you. We just had a conversation. Um, uh, so since I'm not part of the rating system, I'm part of the, the folks who provide solutions that go into the rating system. Um, we're, we're looking for tools um, that help designers make decisions um, in achieving these outcomes. Um, and one of the, the conversations I had actually um, last, was it last week or this week, <laughs> the, um, was with uh, Underwriter Laboratories. Um, and they have a new tool called Spot. Um, and Spot is um, an evolution of a tool that they had before, which actually takes people who have rated products or take, have certified products or have rating systems like Well, um, and it maps solutions, products, to those standards and those certifications, which allows a designer then, if you are saying, I'm trying to achieve a well space, or I'm trying to achieve a lead space, or I'm doing both, um, or choose any other, um, some of the other rating systems, um, and I need a chair, or I need a surface, or I need a, um, a filter, or I need whatever, it will give anybody who has rated a product or has declared something about their product, um, the, what's in it, um, it will pull those forward in what it has in its database right now. And it has um, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of products within the system, and it's going to grow over time. And I think UL is, a, is an interesting player in that marketplace. And I, I know others, I'm sure, will get into that marketplace because they, they have sort of, from a nonprofit perspective, been trying to help consumers understand product and its ability to you know, not catch fire or do other things, um, toxicity. Um, so they're, they're well positioned in the marketplace to do that. So I'm not endorsing them, but they are. That's something that I have seen um, very recently. And Spot actually has been live and prototyped for a year and has had people, um, the ability for people to go on and actually um, find and put solutions in. But this is, uh, they just went live with the site as of uh, this week. Um, so it is a, a something for designers. Because one of the things that, that mixes into this whole system, and we talk about often at ASD, and which is why we made a commitment to the Clinton Global Initiative for Health and Wellness Protocols um, and, and started working on this. And I know that that's where uh, Davos and Well started, was with a commitment to the Clinton Global Initiative, is um, designers, while you are in school, and schools like NYSA do an amazing job of training you, they do not train you to be a chemist. They do not train you to be a doctor. They do not train you to be a, um, a clinical psychologist. But the things that you're doing have all these variations now that we're talking about. And anything that can help you to provide the right outcome and solution and help you with that and add um, uh, frameworks for you to think through are helping you to do your job so that you're not spending hours and hours and hours trying to find products that meet the specs that you're trying to put into a job. You know the outcomes you want and you need help getting the right products that help you to achieve those outcomes. Um, so um, I think there's going to be a lot more happening. As you said, um, USGBC and LEED was a market changer and mm -hmm. um, shifter. Um, and I think Well is going to do the exact same thing and just take it another step farther. Yeah, I, let, me, let me just uh, be a little controversial. I, I would hope that um, ASID would actually um, work with the product community to help them vet 
some of these, like UL and this uh, this uh, product, I don't really yeah. know that that well. But th I think that we will, we saw this in the, in the green, the, the evolution of the green industry, that there were a lot of pop-up uh, uh, solution companies. And, and when, you know, 10 of them come to you and say, well, this is great, but we just need $25,000 for you to put your product in our system, that's when I would run for the hills. I, I, I think that, you know, it's, it, I think it's going to be good for IWBI, USGBC, ASID to help our members and our clients understand where those opportunities are and where you should be careful. Yeah. I think that's important. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, let me, let me, I think I can answer that. Um, first of all, uh, uh, USGBC uh, and IWBI are two different organizations. There's two different rating systems. Um, the lead rating system uh, did uh, dip its toe in the water relative to human health and wellness. There were attributes primarily in uh, materials and air quality and lighting that, that did start to go down that pathway. But the, the work of LEAD, the work for the organization at USGBC, relative to the, you know, we, we can't underestimate the size and the, and the intensity of the sustainability issues of climate change and water quality and, and um, you know, accessible communities and all of the things that are a part of that. Um, the, the fact is that USGBC probably would not have chosen to, be, because I think there's 50 years of important work left to do there, they wouldn't have chosen uh, this other opportunity, which literally is is uh, almost as large in in in, in scale uh, as as the original lead sustainability uh, movement was. So it was this standard uh, well was written by a very knowledgeable group in the Pacific Northwest that understood rating systems, understood the whole opportunity, and it was brought forward to um, to uh, basically uh, fill the need that was not currently in the market place. Um, <clears throat> what, what the Delos folks and what the early folks at IWBI did uh, important is they, they pulled together a, a medical and a scientific body that would act as a peer review. So they took this, this rating system and, and really in a short period of time gave it, gave it all of the, uh, of the uh, uh, scoping and the research and the integrity that it needed to have to go forward. Um, what we are going to do, and we're doing this not only with LEAD, uh, well and LEAD, but we're doing this in um, uh, Australia with the uh, Green Star, uh, uh, which is the equivalent of LEAD there, um, in um, the UK with BRIAM, which is the uh, sustainability rating system uh, for the UK and, and parts of Europe, uh, and a variety of others. We are actually doing what we're calling a crosswalk or, or a, um, a, a, a uh, the, we want to see where the credits are, I have a trouble with this word, duplicative. Where those credits are duplicative, we will create a, a, a harmony and you will, the, the owner will only pay for those once. And, and this will be in collaboration with Reed and, and, and with uh, uh, Well, so that the, the burden is not on the customer to recreate those, those uh, credits. Um, as an early adopter, I'm not sure you'll have that opportunity, Randy, but, but, um, um, but that, that is the way that we can address that. What we, what we really believe is that we, even though this is um, perceived by some as, as a burden uh, because you have to do two systems, um, we actually believe that, that if, we, if we do the, the crossover connection properly, that it is actually going to be one, uh, one view of 
your building, your space, your opportunity. Um, and I don't think um, you can leave one without the other. I personally don't ever want to see uh, a well building that says, well, we don't have to have uh, a sustainability uh, moment here at all. I, I think sustainability and human health and wellness build on each other. They, they support each other. And, and to say I have a, a uh, well uh, platinum um, uh, uh, building that, that I really don't know or care about the environmental performance seems like a major disconnect to me. So that's, that's something we're going to push very hard for, that, that the market understands that, and that we do the associated work to drive the cost down to make it, to make it a seamless opportunity to advance in the marketplace. Thank you. Final question? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Did Rachel Gutter set you up for that question? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I should make you stand up, Rachel Gutter, but just Rachel Gutter, she is now with IWBI. It was the founder of the Center for Green Schools at USGBC. So Rachel, who is our chief product officer for the development of the well standard, um, has institutional knowledge on what uh, colleges, uh, K through 12, and universities uh, uh, need relative to you know we we believe one one of the things that we care deeply about is that we really are in this to transform the market. We have to start with with our with our young children in K through 12, and then moving on to uh, colleges and universities, and and instilling. Uh, an awareness, uh, a respect, and, and a knowledge of why this is important. Those student groups, those, those joined activities, those competitions are immensely important. So we will do everything in our power, and I just thank God I've got Rachel's you know, brain trust there, to, to help support the idea of how we will do that going forward. But absolutely, we will. And can we can yeah, take yes. one more I question? I was going to say that. So Susan. Susan. Yes. Yes. And you guys need to talk me back from the ledge now because I'm politically nuts at the moment because, <laughs> because of all the things that we have the pipeline, we have coal, we have, uh, uh, again, you, you're allowed to pollute the stream. I mean, everything, executive orders, one after the other. And so you are in a, in a really great position, Rick and, and Randy, that how does this get to the next level without, with, with uh, people saying, well, it's not important anymore. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And we, and you're saying, it, and we, I totally agree, we are in a renaissance, and we are really trying very hard to <coughs> kind of switch over to the next level. But everything around us says, you don't have to do that. What are you doing? I mean, and, and uh, a lot of people, a lot of developers will probably uh, say, well, I don't need this. Sure. I'm going to make money sure. because money is the, the kind of king of today. So, so how do you guys respond to this? And please tell me, I can live. I, mm -hmm. can you I, can live, yes. Can I, go ahead. Well, <laughs> it's, it's in, I wish I had, a, yeah. I wish I had a, a, an actual graph, and that is um, I actually charted the performance of USGBC and LEED, and the greatest spike of growth for the organization over the past 15 years was during the eight years of the George Bush administration. And you remember, we were nothing compared to what we're in now, which is could be considered the dark ages. But, but, but we were in a time frame where people were worried. What's going to happen with EPA? What's going to happen with water regulation, air quality, and all those things? 
And the, the advancement of everything that USGBC and LEED brought to a commercial market, I think was about this moment where, where all of us, we get, we get depressed, we cannot watch the news and, and sleep well at night. But what we know at the bottom of our hearts is where government won't do it for us, we'll do it for ourselves. And, and the thing I like about this is we're, we've taken the power. We are creating and stimulating markets that generate revenue that will, that will invest in, in products, technology, services, systems that care about the health and wellness of individuals. Um, I have a, a good friend who's a CEO of a major uh, uh, organization, you know, $28 billion organization. And when I asked him a very personal question, um, if Donald Trump says you no longer have to uh, protect water or air quality or, or these emission standards, you know, what do you do? And he, and he just laughed. He said, he said, we are planning our board, our mission, we're planning the next 25 years of our corporate survival. He said, we don't, we don't pick a political cycle. He goes, in this case, it'll probably be a very short one, but we certainly <laughs> don't pick a political cycle to, to develop our product plan. So we may show up at the White House and sit around and shake a hand and get a free pen, but at the end of the day, if he says tomorrow that the emission standards for all vehicles is now non-existent, any, any manufacturer that's been working on electric cars and battery storage investment and all of this future, nobody's going backwards. They're just not going to antagonize this group in the White House uh, with a message like that. And I wish they would. I mean, I, I'm always up for a little, like a little bit of a battle. But, um, but in this case, I, I actually, um, I feel energized. I think this is a moment. Everything that they want to show us that we don't have to do, we can do on our own. And, and the buildings will be better and employees will be excited. Sadly, at the end of the day, they'll probably try to tra take credit for it. But, you know, it really doesn't matter as long as we, we don't ever feel victimized that we can't do what we want to do. Yep. So, is there a campaign from your organization to identify these firms, these developers, to, to and, and inform the Wall Street Journal? Let them do stories on these yep. people. These are great business stories. Yeah. We need those stories because we get the other stories galore, and this is a real great counterpunch. Yep. Because there are organizations, there are corporations, there are uh, developers that are doing just exactly the, the thing that is being destroyed. And, and so that is a powerful story. I want to read that. Yeah. Yep. I agree, Susan, completely. Well, and I think um, to, to pivot off of what Rick was saying, and then um, some interesting things that I've seen in as uh, well has been introduced in the marketplace. One is um, the first certified space was um, a, for the pilot uh, project was C.B. Richard Ellis. Um, so you, a corporate real estate organization was the first out of the gates to basically certify their headquarters um, and become the, the voice of why this matters. Um, and they were immediately able to talk about the health and wellness of their employees and actually put employees coming into the office more because, you know, as we know, corporate real estate people can basically work in the field pretty much every single day if they want to. Um, and they were until they built this headquarters and now all the employees are coming into the office. And that was, that's been documented and, and talked about. Um, and I think, um, you know, with Paul Shala's background, um, his first network of folks that he started talking to about this was the corporate real estate world. Um, and now the corporations who also are competing for talent are seeing this as an added component to it and are all also getting those data points in place. Um, so on that component, I think very smart from um, a, uh, a well and a, a Delos perspective of who to engage first. Um, and I will say, and, and as a person who leads in the interior design organization and the most members of interior designers of any organization out there, um, you guys need to come along. Um, because what we're seeing in the, what now I think, is it 1700 um, Well AP? Um, interior designers are rep representing a very small percentage of Well APs out there now. 
um, the uptick that we were hoping for very quickly of interior designers, because this is your domain, is that you would go and get your well AP fairly quickly, because it would be easy for you to do. And we're seeing a small um, uptick in that right now. So we're going to do whatever we can to empower you to take that exam and to sit for it and begin to, to have that certification after your name um, to show that you, yeah, I mean, you have the degree that says that you're down this path, but this, this is that extra level that says you've done it. I um, mean, we already have an incentive program out um, that we did in partnership that you get 30% off as an ASD member in, uh, in registering to take the exam. So um, I encourage you to do that. The last thing I'll say, going back to, to your point on the macro scale of, of change um, as well, is you know, if leverage points um, in our global world are only at the, the, the national level um, and the federal level, um, we are doomed. Um, but that's not the case. Um, we watch, uh, so while I had a decade in, in mission uh, or in um, management consulting, I also had a decade in mission-driven nonprofits and working on social justice issues and change around um, education reform um, and uh, affordable housing and other types of things in, in my background. And believe me, when the federal government wasn't giving us the things that we needed, we went to state and local governments to do what we needed to do um, and vice versa in, in different situations. So. Um, and we went to corporate America at times uh, to advocate for us. So you find your champions where you can and your change agents where you can, and you maximize the utilization of those. Um, the city of San Francisco is amazing as being a change agent because every major corporation needs to do business with San Francisco. And they are usually they very much leading on lots of different issues and, and areas. And so what they do is they tend to put a state or city ordinance in. And well, once that city ordinance is, is in and the company has to then follow it, they don't do it just for San Francisco. They do it for their entire company. Um, and we've seen lots and lots of changes come just from one city doing one thing. Um, so I think what we need to do is figure out where the leverage points are, and we need to, to attack them and, and bring them through and give them their pathway through. And I think they're out there. And I think a lot of corporations, as you said, are, are leading in this, this charge. And, and we just need to showcase them, as you said. Yeah. Sir, do you have a, a CEU program in design school? like New York School of Interior Design for, for professionals in New York, let's say, to come in and take their uh, ratings, the AP, lead AP, well AP ratings, so that they can qualify. And uh, David, where are you? So Rachel and I and ASID are working together on some of those things, and other people are as well. But yes, there is going to be a macro system of programs and initiatives to help people sit for the uh, well AP and pass the exam successfully. And Ellen has her hand up. So, you know, thank you, Susan, for mentioning that. So we have, through our continuing education, we are invested in helping people prepare for their professional exams. So right now, students who graduate for free can take the practical preparation for NCIDQ. But also, I signed up to take the LAP exam. I had exactly like 250 days to figure out how to do that. Yep. I understand that there's no, there's no formalized training course yeah. There are, yeah. You're going to be offering that to yeah. There's some things out there that are hitting the marketplace almost as we speak. Um, and we're working on some things. And NYSA should be working on some things. So there will be an ecosystem similar to LEAD and Center Alert to the NCIDQ and others to, out there. Um, there's, there's a lot of good information that will be coming out very shortly before you have to take the exam. Yeah. So stay tuned, yeah. I would say. So. Um, I, I won't, well, I, I tend to commit to these things. So one of the things that, that Rachel and I were talking about is I would love to pick a date um, in the not too distant future and literally have it announced that that is the interior design day to sit for the exam um, and to get as many people into the pipeline to start prepping for it so that there is a sense of cohort and community that you're all going for this together and that there will be 50, 100, 200, 300, 400 interior designers that are going to do that. So we will make that happen, and you'll see that announcement come out that we are going to make that happen, because it is important for us to get you through that at Well AP. And there is, there is I can't say that, right? You were the CEO. You said <laughs> I, I'm looking at Rachel because I just want to make sure that, and I know we're this close to it, but um, you know, as long as you don't tweet this tonight, um, we are, we are, uh, it is a very um, uh, onerous exam and, and, and it has to be because of the subject matter. Um, so what we're, what we're doing is we're, we're going to approach it differently than 
uh, we ever did before, and we're going to allow uh, for an open book exam. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and you know what? You, you think about the way we all learn today. We don't learn just through memorization. It doesn't make sense. Everything that we do in life is, is about accessing uh, a database, Google, whatever, to be able to find the information, to fill in the missing pieces in our brain, and allow us to take that information forward and make better decisions. So, so we're trying to be more modern in the way that these ideas come forward and that the, the exam is, is uh, taken. There will still be the, the, the complete, um, um, you know, the, the, the very careful monitoring and the proctoring and all that. But, but ultimately, it will be, um, it, it is about changing the way people think. And, and you don't do that by uh, creating a system of, of, of uh, winners and losers. You want everyone to, to, to get to that point. So can't wait to hear when you get your uh, yeah. AP. <laughs> so um, as we kind of close this out, uh, I just want to underscore a couple things. One is, this is the domain of interior designers. Um, you have the power to lead in this area. You have the power to lead projects in this area, not be coming in at the end, but actually leading from the beginning of creating these types of environments for folks. Um, and this is a real opportunity. Um, there has been a threat of commoditization of interior design to where it literally is anybody who has either a computer or says that they want to do this, that they were beginning to step into this space and begin in, in, in mass numbers. Um, this is our opportunity to differentiate in the marketplace and really underscore that design matters. What you do matters and it has a real impact and has a real value proposition to it in the marketplace. Um, so we need to lead this charge along with the, um, the, the world that's creating this and we need to use it as a place to re really put the punctuation mark about what interior design is back on the map um, and take it back from the, the mass media version of what it is that you do. Um, so we are leading that effort um, with all of the, the colleagues that, that we have out there to do that. Um, and so we hope that you're coming along with us in this journey. Um, and I don't know if you have some final comments as we I, close I just, things out. I just want to add on to that point that um, when LEED came to the marketplace, it really was uh, immediately taken up by the architects, then the engineers, then I think the design community and then the brokerage community after that, as far as the real leaders of all that, um, I see an absolute opportunity in this opportunity for the design community to be the first. That is the first group that will make those important decisions and help a, a, a client understand that they actually can create a space like this. And, and I think in that process, you will do the work you've always done because you've always helped people get to that point of understanding how the, the space can be better for them. In this case, you'll just have some science and information to back up that how much better that will be for them and how, how it'll affect their lives in a, in a much different way. And, and just my closing uh, point is there's one other project that I'm very, very excited about. Um, it too will be a lead platinum and a well platinum, but not before yours. Yeah. <laughs> but this is, um, this is the orphanage in Haiti mm. that US Green Building Council uh, decided five years ago, four years ago, after the earthquake, to, um, uh, to, uh, to build a lead platinum uh, facility there. And, um, and through our, our uh, getting to know the Delos folks and, and with IWBI, we, we asked if we could bring that well platinum there as well. So this little uh, orphanage in Haiti will be awesome. a stunning example of leadership for the world. So um, uh, we'll, we'll celebrate around yeah. that uh, eventual win as well. And what so. a better way to express Prince Laurie than to get the Thank you both for being here. This thank you. conversation was really enlightening and positive in light of what's going on out there. Um, <laughs> and if there's anything that the New York School of Interior Design can do to advance what you all are doing, please let us know. We will for sure. Thank you very thank much. Thank you all for thank being you. here. And